Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really excited this week. Uh, so every year we do this series. Uh, one week we feature a panel of experts. <coughs> Last year it was uh, lawyers, and a judge. Um, this year we're focusing on the non uh, the nonprofit sector. Next year possibly government. Um, and so this year we have uh, three executives from the nonprofit world, broadly speaking, who are going to sp uh, come and share their experiences about what it's like to work in that world. Um, they're going to say a lot about their, their own, they'll, they can introduce, introduce themselves in more detail, but very briefly, uh, Matt Martin here on my left was until recently the Executive Director of Social Advocates for Youth, which uh, works with children and families for a variety of services, and now is the VP of Community Government Relations is that right? uh, at Redwood Credit Union. Uh, in the middle is Paul Fordham, who is the Deputy Executive Director of Homeward Bound Marin, uh, which provides shelter and services to the homeless in Marin County. And Karen Demrest, on your right, uh, is the Vice President for Programs at Community Foundation Sonoma County. Uh, in that role, she connects donors to nonprofits throughout the county in a variety of endeavors. So please join me in welcoming our panel today. And we'll format things a little differently. Uh, today we're gonna just have each of them say, uh, speak for a few minutes, and then we'll take questions from, from all of you. So Paul, do you wanna start things up? Sure. Um, so I guess I can start, um, I'll tell you a little bit, of, a bit about how I got to where I am and the position I hold now. Um, but I'll start off by saying, you know, some people have a really clear identified career path, knowing what they want to do. Uh, I was not one of those people at all. I had no clue what I wanted to do and sort of fumbled around uh, on various career paths. And along the way, um, I started volunteering at a homeless program in Bath in England. And so it's like a soup kitchen. And I really went there because I was waiting for my visa to come to move from England to the States. And um, a bunch of my friends left town and I was just waiting and waiting for the government to process my visa. And so I thought, well, I should at least use my time somewhat productively, and I volunteered at this homeless soup kitchen knowing nothing, and at the end of the first experience volunteering, the first kind of shift, uh, I, my whole, like my perception of who was homeless and why was completely shattered. Uh, I walked away from that first experience volunteering, um, thinking that all my troubles, I thought I had a hard life and was going through some troubles, I had a huge dose of perspective. You know, everyone else was having, the people in the homeless pro program were having a much harder day than I just had. And I walked away feeling grateful for my own blessings. So really, a really kind of almost self-centered introduction to working with homeless people, but it really was um, just this big dose of reality. Uh, and then I also was fascinated by the stories. I found, found it easy to dismiss people who are homeless as making bad choices and for serving them volunteering to serve them soup and lunch and dinner at the, the homeless program, got to know people, I'd hear their stories and each one was different and it shattered all the perceptions I had. So I was just fascinated both by the stories, by the perspective I had on my own life. I kind of became hooked on this, this, this uh, work. So my visa finally arrived, I came to the States and um, I've been working professionally actually as a travel agent so I could get cheap flights to come and see my girlfriend in the States. And I got to the States, I had a visa to be here and get married, but I wasn't allowed to work. So I thought, well, I might as well try <coughs> volunteering at a homeless program in the States and see what happened there. Um, and so I was at the soup kitchen in Sacramento, and they said, well, what else can you do? I said, well, I don't know, really. And uh, I had an English degree, so they said, okay, you can write. Well, try writing some grant proposals. And so I wrote um, 10 proposals, and nine of them were funded. And I thought, oh, maybe when that work visa comes through, I can get paid to do this work. And so that's so my entry, the reason I want to tell you this story is like my entry to this world of work was through volunteering. And I think it's a great way to jump into um, nonprofits because I can tell you now on the other side as being part of nonprofit leadership, we hire a ton of our volunteers. So as a volunteer, you can try out different experiences, different work worlds, different environments. You can find sort of a passion along the way. But once you get your foot in the door, you can get all kinds of different opportunities and find out are you good at writing grants? If one out of 10 had got, not got funded, it would not have been a career path for me. So I accidentally stumbled on this, this path. Uh, and now we are looking for reliable people. And in the world of nonprofits, it's more about are you a good personality fit? 
and the skills you can learn along the way rather than do you have the best resume. Um, so, uh, so that was my intro. And then I did get a job working in the Bay Area as a fund helping a fundraising consultant. And I discovered Homeward Bound of Marin, where I work now. And was just found it a fascinating program. We have currently five shelters for homeless families, homeless adults. We have 11 housing programs for homeless families and homeless adults and people with persistent mental illness. And um, we also have a culinary job training program. So, um, so we train people to get jobs in the food industry and then related to that, we run a bunch of businesses that generate income for the nonprofit. So one of the things Josh asked me to mention was um, sort of the different challenges of working within a nonprofit and some of the funding challenges. Well, there are continual challenges. Uh, some foundations, not all of them, are a bit flighty in what they want to fund. So one year they'll give you lots of money, next year they change their priorities and there's no money left. Uh, same with government agencies, they can be great and then suddenly they can be a change at the head of HUD and the budgets get cut back. Uh, so for a really successful nonprofit, it's great to be you know, really diverse in your how you raise money. So my job at Homeward Bound, I started off as the fundraising assistant, then I was in charge of fundraising and now I'm the deputy director which means I still oversee fundraising and they give me a bunch of other things to do too like hiring and firing and legal stuff. But with the Culinary Academy, we've had the opportunity to start uh, a range of social enterprises. So food-related social enterprises. We're training people who are formerly homeless to get jobs in the food industry. So why not see along the way while they're gaining their skills, can we help, uh, can we help work with them to make products that then we sell and raise money for the nonprofit? So if a foundation or a government uh, cuts their budget or redirects their focus, we're generating some of our own income as well to offset that. So we started with a few social enterprises and now we generate uh, last year about $900,000 in our own business income as well as employing a large number of people who were formerly homeless and hadn't worked for a large number of years, found it difficult to get jobs because they had two or three year gaps in their resumes and maybe they've been to prison and things like that. So uh, for me, the fascinating part of my job is that I get to write creatively, I get to write funding proposals, but I've also learned how to run businesses. Um, I feel like I have an MBA without actually going to college because I had to start uh, a range of businesses from the ground up and then along the way interview everybody I could uh, to give me advice on how I should run my business and pick and choose what, uh, what advice to take. Um, and I tell you, again, I tell you all this to show you sort of within the nonprofit world, you have to wear so many hats. So it's a great place to volunteer because you can try doing different things like if you came to me to volunteer you could work in the kitchen you could be working uh, serving soup you could be writing grants you could be trying all these different aspects of the of the nonprofit out but also when you're working within a nonprofit we hire from within you promote from within a lot of times and then when you get a job it's not just okay I do marketing and that's what I do I do marketing fundraising business development I do hiring and firing like there's so many different opportunities uh, within the world of nonprofits, I mean, and probably my colleagues here might say the same thing or similar thing that you know there are a lot of opportunities, and that can be frustrating sometimes because you have to do everything, but it can all be re can also be really rewarding because there's so many chances to build your skills and uh, and just experience different opportunities that you wouldn't get if you were pigeonholed in a for-profit job. And then the last thing which I haven't even mentioned is the whole reward factor. Um, you know, I, people come up to me on a very regular basis and say, you saved my life. Um, now, I didn't save anybody's life. We created like a space where they could become their best person or they could make changes in their life. Um, they make the change that helps them change their life. But to hear that reward or to see people make that transformation is so rewarding. And I get paid reasonably well. And there has been a shift in the nonprofit world now where salaries are getting much better. It's, uh, it's not just considered charity anymore. It's more uh, work of the community that's being done by, uh, by people with good motivations, but the salaries are pretty good. But the more rewarding piece is I feel like I'm making a difference in the world. And um, I really love my job. And mainly it's because of the way, the impact we have on others. There's a lot of meaning. So. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. So my name is Matt. Uh, I get to be the Vice President of Community and Government Relations at Redwood Credit Union. 
and I am day two on that job. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to be very clear about something. You know, when I was sitting in Miss Briggs' uh, first grade class back in New Bedford, Massachusetts, as a kid, uh, when she passed out that worksheet that day, they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I didn't write down VP of Community and Government Relations. <laughs> Uh, surprisingly enough, I know that may shock you. Uh, the, the reason why I say that is uh, I want to echo something that's very important uh, that, that Paul said, and, and that is about just wanting to make a difference. And this career path uh, that I've got a chance to be on now uh, has been something that I did not plan. When I was a 10-year-old kid, Growing up back east, I was the youngest of five. And my parents were teen parents. I was the first in my family to go to college. And I was 10 years old when I became an uncle for the first time. And I remember very vividly the feeling that I was watching these babies being born into my family to parents who were my siblings who weren't ready. And I really wanted to help. I wanted to step in as much as I could to make a difference for these babies, these children. And I didn't quite understand, uh, not until a little while afterwards, that my siblings, their challenges as parents, were actually the challenges of my parents. And as I got to know my parents' story, I clearly understood that their challenges as parents were actually their parents' challenges. And that there was this generational cycle that was holding us back. And I've come to understand that for me today as a professional, getting the chance to sit down in front of you this afternoon, the reason why I get to do this work is because I so thoroughly believe of helping folks break those cycles that hold them back. And so, I started off going to college uh, back in Rhode Island, which is one of the 50 states here in the United States. It does exist. It really does. You could probably fit it on the campus of SSU, but it really does exist. And uh, went to college in Rhode Island and to become an elementary school teacher. And I succeeded in doing so. I taught third and fourth grade in Providence which is the capital of Rhode Island. And there I became a AmeriCorps member too. As an AmeriCorps member committed to service, again, under the auspice of just wanting to help people break these cycles, I helped build the Providence Children's Museum. There I met this phenomenal woman from California and uh, from Ukiah, nonetheless, wherever that was at that time, I had no clue. And I chased her out here as soon as I could and we lived in Oakland where I became an elementary school teacher in Oakland, in Fruitvale, at Lazier Elementary where I taught fourth and fifth grade. And I had a class of 32 students in Oakland on 29th Ave. I lived on 28th. I used to walk to school with my kids. And after a year of teaching school, I felt like I wanted a bigger classroom than 32. And so I got involved with the nonprofit sector for the very first time in the Bay Area, Bay Area running after school programs in West Oakland, East Oakland, uh, Mission, Bayview Hunters Point. And uh, I cut my teeth uh, learning some really important lessons about those cycles that hold people back. But it really fueled me for wanting to deepen this work. Uh, Short time afterwards, I was lucky enough to marry that girl from California. We had a child, and we moved to Sonoma County, where I became the director of operations at Boys and Girls Clubs of Petaluma. Again, so here I am from the school, elementary school teacher, after school programs in the nonprofit sector, now getting a chance to run clubhouses, more after school programs in Petaluma. And then I, at that time, just felt like the need or desire to want to help as much as I possibly could 
and I heard about an organization based out of Santa Rosa called Social Advocates for Youth. And one of the things that Paul said is like, kind of just like lean in. They were looking for a fund development director at the time. That was almost eight years ago, a little more than eight years ago now. And I never had raised a dime. I had never asked a single person in this world for a dime. Oh, actually, one time I was stuck at the bar and I didn't have enough money. I did ask someone for a dime. <laughs> but besides that, I never asked money from someone for somebody else. But this organization, Social Advocates for Youth, that was focusing on ending homelessness for young people needed a development director to raise funds. And I applied for the job and I got a chance to earn it. Two years later, I became the executive director and I felt like my classroom was widening, right? First it was 32, then it was like 300, and now it was like 2,500. By the time I left Social Advocates for Youth, which was like three weeks ago, my classroom was a little bigger than 7,000 between five to 24 year olds. And I was always looking for that next opportunity, right? In this process of being the leader of social advocates for youth within this organization, of how we can serve more young people. How can we serve them more and serve them better and help break these cycles? And we did so through some pretty creative projects that I got a chance to be a part of. And in about mid-November, Redwood Credit Union, which is also a nonprofit, which is totally different, Right? So I'm coming from the classroom, going to a nonprofit sector that's direct service, and now I'm in a nonprofit that's a financial institution. And they're saying, we want to do more. They have 270,000 members. They're in you know, Sonoma County, Mendocino County, San Francisco. They're in Lake, they're in Napa. And so now my classroom has grown from 32 to 300 to 7,000 to 270,000. And so what can I do now to help? And so that, what can I do now to help, has been really been the guiding principle in this career path, which who knows? I'll see what I can do to help and continue figuring that out so that I can leave this place better than which I found it because I thoroughly believe that's our rent that we should be paying on this earth. So I think I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Karen, who is uh, absolutely a fantastic colleague and leader in our community in doing foundation work. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be here with you and look forward to your questions in a little bit. Thanks. I'm just gonna start by dispelling a myth that you don't have to wear blue if you're in the nonprofit world. Yes, you don't, <laughs> on Tuesdays. We may set that up as a belief, but we'll just get rid of that right away. Right. <laughs> I'm Karen Demarest. I um, have the great honor of working as the Vice President for Programs at the Community Foundation, Sonoma County. And uh, I, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. And I had not heard, I know Matt's story a little bit, I hadn't heard Paul's story, but you'll see that there is a theme running through our stories. I did not, um, at 10 years old say I'm going into philanthropy. In fact, I didn't even know what that word meant until a few years ago, perhaps. But I, um, I at 10 years old, was actually in my basement organizing plays by the neighbors. And that was my passion, was the theater, the arts. And I got knocked off that passion because I cared about um, also making money. And uh, I started working in the, in the corporate world when I graduated from college. But I had my theater company on the side and I kept my passions going. Around the age of 30, I, uh, on my 30th birthday, I took myself to Bali for a vacation. And I realized that I had a choice in, in this world, that I could do what I was told to do which was to follow a particular career path that allowed me certain freedoms because money was attached to it, or I could do what my heart said and I could do what I was driven to do, which was to be sure that every person, every young person had access to arts and arts education. So I came back and I quit my job to uh, the disappointment of many and I, I traveled around the world for a couple of years to get perspective. And 
I, I came back. Unfortunately, what happened when I left was the first dot-com boom and all the people that were in the business that I quit became millionaires. <laughs> So I came back with a backpack and all my friends were millionaires. And it was a really fascinating moment for me to say, what are my values? Have I missed out? A am I still gonna be friends with these folks who literally had made millions of dollars by selling this company? So, um, and I was the happiest I think I've ever been. That's when I met my husband, when life was really open because I was unattached to what I'd been told was important. I knew what I cared about, and I started working as a teaching artist in Bayview Hunter Point in San Francisco, um, bringing the arts to schools that had no access. And it was deeply rewarding and meaningful work to me, and I never looked back. So when I moved to Sonoma County, there was no programs that were putting teaching artists into the schools, and yet there was a huge disparity in access to arts education um, based on the fact that if the schools had uh, parents who could afford to raise that money, the kids had access to music and arts, and those schools that didn't have those parent resources did not. And that was a disparity I could not abide by. So I um, decided to get my teaching credential. There's even a student here today that was one of my students in <laughs> when I was doing my student teaching. Um, and uh, I said, I'm on a mission. I, I, I need to actually address this here in Sonoma County. So I got my teaching credential. I started working with the County of Os Office of Education, the Arts Council, to start to advocate for bringing more arts into our schools in an equitable, equitable way. Then, suddenly, I saw a job description. And I was hired by Robert Judd. This audience is full of people that I know. <laughs> <love. Awesome. laughs> How did you do this? Yeah. <laughs> All the people in my story are actually in the audience. Robert Judd was the vice president for programs at the Community Foundation, the same position I have now. And fortunately, I had an entry into philanthropy that was not through um, any kind of study or past experience, but because I had expertise in a particular field. It was a program officer job for the arts and education, and that was exactly what I had through the course of my commitment and study had expertise in. And I was hired to um, actually give money away in those two fields. So it was a thank you, Robert. Really appreciate you believing in me. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank mm -hmm. you. I've since had the great honor to move into the vice president position where I, I have my job is to steward the funds that are left by donors um, to make an impact in our community. So uh, the foundation, I, I think it was so such a great um, overview that Paul gave is that in the nonprofit world, it's you know you're, you're not generating profits every year. You need to figure out a way to make this thing work. And um, there's a whole host of ways that can happen. So wonderful to have an earned income stream, like, like, like Paul talked about, to offset uh, grant contracts um, from, from government agencies, from foundations. Um, sometimes there's membership fees. There's all different ways that nonprofits are able to fund themselves. And the role that I play is the, the grants from the foundation. And so um, we, here locally, we're a community foundation. There's a, a, just approximately 600 community foundations around the country. In the Bay Area, we have the top three largest community foundations out of, uh, top three in, in, out of 12. Silicon Valley Community Foundation is the largest in the country, I would as assume mm -hmm. the world. Um, San Francisco Foundation, Marin Community Foundation. So we have a lot of philanthropic dollars here in this community, I mean, in the Bay Area. Community foundations are place-based, so we're meant to really know our community and inform our donors about the greatest needs that need to be funded in our community. So um, my job is, well, let me just say, we, we do about $11 million of grant making in, in the, per year and about 80% of that is coming from donors who are advising on how that money is spent. The other 20% is left as legacy gifts, so when people pass away, they say, okay, I want you, Community Foundation, to make decisions about what the grants are gonna be ongoing. And that's my job, so I have a budget of around two and a half, three million dollars, <coughs> and my job is to make decisions about where that money goes each year. So 
we do grants either competitively where we re-grant review grant applications that I don't know if I've ever read one of yours because no, no. you're in Marin. Right. But <laughs> I've, I've written them yes. a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so we read grant applications and it's, we have to select the top ones to give funding to or we invite organizations to uh, apply non-competitively. That's the sort of grant making side of what we do, but it's also important to know that we, we play a really unique role because we're, we're, we're neutral. We don't run programs. We're not needing to advocate for a particular area um, in homelessness, for example, um, because we're watching all the needs. So we are able to enter into conversations in the community to help look at systems change. And you know, you can, we can think about grant making as pennies, literally pennies on the dollar of what government funding is able to do. So part of our responsibility is to be advocating for better systems that are supporting the change that our community needs in order to really impact the people that, that need it most. So our role is both as grant maker and as, um, as influencer to convene organizations, to be in conversation with each other, to be in partnership, to really study data and, um, and, and know where we can have the greatest impact. So I, I feel so incredibly honored to do the work that I do. And like both of you, I could have never been sitting where you sit now and even know that such an opportunity existed, let alone know that I could actually have this work. Um, you know, it's truly a career of the heart and of passion, and it's such a cliche to say, but it, I think all of us show that if you continue to put your values first and seek out opportunities, take risks, be bold, do something you've never done before, become a grant writer even though you've never written anything like that, that these, that's the beauty, I think, of the nonprofit world mm -hmm. as you were describing is that Opportunity is there. It's ripe with opportunity. And I think it's a changing field from, from philanthropy, can I, I can say for certain, that we're really needing to look at um, some, some tough things that, that, that we need to consider. For example, all those endowment funds. An endowment fund is when a gift is given to, and, and it cannot be actually be spent. It has to, the, the gift has to stay the exact same amount as, it was as, as the value of its historical gift, and you can only pay out a certain percentage of it each year. So there's billions of dollars that are not accessible to make change that have been given to these endowments that are not doing anything but being invested. Hopefully they're being invested socially responsibly, but a lot of times they aren't. And so this is something that we're having to grapple with as an, as a, as an industry. As, mm -hmm. Is it really, are, are these endowments really valuable and are there other ways that we can use them? And I think that's gonna be the challenge going forward is how can we really make change? So I think I'll stop there and let you ask questions. Thank you everyone. Uh, so again, uh, any questions for any or all of our speakers are most welcome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, I mean, there's there's lots. Um, I, you know, in, in my previous role uh, within Social Advocates for Youth, we have a facility that provides low uh, affordable housing, essentially, for young people who are former foster care, former homeless. And there is a pool table in the room where the community gathers to to have dinner and hang out. And um, once a month, there is cake and uke night. So there's a volunteer who's also connected to the Community Foundation of Sonoma County, former leader, Kay Marquette, shows up once a month with a homemade cake for our young people uh, who otherwise wouldn't have their birthdays celebrated. And then another volunteer shows up with a van full of ukuleles. And we pass out the ukuleles, we pass out the the, the cake, and we were, I was there one evening, and, and a young man by the name of, uh, let's just say James, is there. 
and uh, James had been uh, a part of the community for some time, and uh, he asked me to play pool with him. And to, from that moment prior to, he, he hadn't really ever engaged with me, even though I'd been there many different times. And James was an exceptionally smart and talented, uh, well-spoken young person with incredible amount of uh, upside and potential. And I got a chance just to be reminded uh, why this work is so important. Because as Paul was saying, we all come to our paths, however we come to our path. And for James, that's how he got there. And we all need one another. People need people. And it was just, again, one of thousands of reminders that just first one came to my mind in regards to why this work is so important. I can say to follow that, uh, I mean, kind of a similar story, but uh, in my job, I've got to learn how to make little mini documentaries. So I work with a videographer and myself and the videographer go out with this camera and we, I identify someone um, who we've worked with, uh, who's transformed their life. And then we sit down and we interview them and I ask questions and the videographer shoots it. And then we edit it down so that you don't hear me, you just hear somebody telling their story. Um, and that's been fascinating because eventually my friend said to me, well, you're a producer now. It's like, oh, I see that on the credits for movies. I didn't even know what a producer did, and now I'm a producer. Um, and we, then we edit the stories together and make these two to three minutes little mini documentaries. But in, in the process of making one, this guy, Phil, he's 70 years old, uh, seven zero, it's like 70 years old. And he, uh, he was a Vietnam, uh, he works on, on a medivac, um, like the helicopters that flew into people who were in Vietnam and have been seriously injured and airlift them out did two, ter two terms at Vietnam, and then really struggled when he came back with the things he'd seen and became a homeless alcoholic living on the streets. So now he's housed, he's been housed for over 10 years now, uh, and uh, subsidized by the agency I work for, Homeward Bound. And he was telling his story and he said, he said, since I've been able to pay my rent, which is, he only gets $900 a month and he pays $400, nearly $500 in rent. So, but since I've been able to pay that rent and have a place to live. I've got my self dignity, you know, self respect back, my dignity back, and uh, I now these last ten years have been the happiest part of my life because I feel like I'm contributing and giving back, uh, and I'm able to maintain my sobriety now, and I'm in housing. But it's mainly because I have an affordable place to live, and without any nonprofit subsidizing the housing, there's no way in Marin County he could pay five hundred dollars a month in rent. And yet, this is somebody who served to defend the country and who's you know, really his trauma is part of our larger, bigger trauma of having multiple wars overseas. And yet, so for me, it made me realize what we do is really important. We're giving people back their own, allowing them to reclaim their dignity, their self-worth in this community by offering some subsidized housing. And um, it was a great, mo you know, great feeling to realize we're, you know, part of the solution. Plus I learned to become a producer, can put that on my resume now. <laughs> uh, and then also, the, I think the second way to answer that is I just turned 40 recently, and a bunch of my friends are really having crises around their jobs and their career paths and some of the choices they made, some <coughs> things you alluded to, like, okay, I'm doing okay, but what do I really want in this life? I'm getting older, or my kids ask me, what do you do? I can't explain to them because it's a corporate financial analyst job, right? And so these people are having crises, uh, sort of, self-identification midlife crises and uh, I don't I have no empathy for them because I love my job <laughs> I love what I do every day and I've done it same job for 11 years it's wonderful so I mean again then that's a moment for me when I hear those conversations like oh, I'm really lucky I didn't plan this I stumbled on this and it's so rewarding and I love getting up and going to work I guess I'll just talk about the most recent, which was right before I drove here. I went to my mailbox and I picked out a I, there was a letter written from an artist. Now, I, I mean, I, arts is obviously my passion, but we do grant making primarily in health and human services, the environment, education, even animal welfare, and a little bit of grant making for the arts. So this was particularly <coughs> significant to me, but we have an emerging artists program. And, um, and this artist was working in her studio by herself for years and had never been noticed before. And someone nominated her for this program. And s several other artists came in to her studio and looked at her work and she was granted 
um, this award of being one of the discovered emerging artists. And she wrote a letter about how this one moment and this small grant of $5,000, but she got a show at the Petaluma Art Center and she had people see her for the very first time had completely transformed her life, her sense of herself and her sense of her identity as an artist. So one little example, I have so many, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Thanks for the question. Other questions? Well, um, I can't say that I know foundation specifically, but I can say how what you do will be so, as it could be so essential to the fields that we work in. Um, you know, data is so important and it's becoming even more important. And developing, you know, really good technology that is accessible to nonprofits that can help them um, collect and share data um, is is really a part of where the field is going. So I could see see that. I mean, Silicon Valley, I would just go on their website, the Silicon Valley Community mm -hmm. Foundation, and look at what they're doing because right they're right in the hub. Um, you know, with grants, it's it, it's not possible for foundations to make grants to individuals. Um, we can only make grants to other nonprofit 501c3 entities. But if you have a great idea and you um, believe that somebody else believes in your idea, you can find a nonprofit to be your fiscal sponsor. And then they can write the grant and give that money to you. So there are ways to think about accessing foundation money um, if you have an excellent idea that you want to move forward. But I, absolutely, data is so essential. And big data, shared data across systems is, is where the field is going. Do you guys have yeah, any? Yeah, I, I got two for you. There's the Zero Divide Foundation in San Francisco. I don't know if they still focus on this, but they used to uh, focus on promoting technology and uh, youth that didn't really, low-income youth that maybe haven't had access to technology. And that can be everything from producing a podcast to learning programming to, so that, that's one I would look at. And so that knowledge is maybe five years old, but that's Zero Divide. Uh, and then the other one, uh, the Tipping Point community, they do a bunch of things, but uh, having been turned down from getting their funding, uh, mainly we were turned down because we weren't data driven enough as an organization. So they really want you to see collecting data, uh, analyzing it, and then using it to make your day-to-day -day decisions. So a lot of nonprofits collect data to report back to a funder. Like when a funder gives you money, they're gambling the world's gonna be a better place, and how are you gonna report back at the end of that grant period, look, we made some change in the world. But, um, so that's how traditionally nonprofits use data. But now, what the tipping point community was saying to us and we're now beginning to realize is like, don't just use the data for your funders, use it in your day-to-day -day experience to look at your programs. Well, why did 75% of people leave our programs to, uh, for housing? Was, you know, what was the turning point? Of those 25% who didn't, look at the data and what did they not do that other people did? And, uh, and where are they moving? And how do we track them for six, six months down the road and 12 months down the road? So I agree with you, data is becoming far <coughs> more important to both foundations and nonprofits. And I think you'll see more and more jobs coming up. It's like a data analyst, uh, mm -hmm. bo both sides of that field. I know the Sonoma County Medical Association Foundation or the uh, very SCMAF, if you're into acronyms, uh, they, they provide laptops and access to technology for former foster care youth. And they do that through Voices Sonoma. It's a mm -hmm. tremendous partner here locally. Uh, and I would recommend them as just a local entity doing that work with a very specific population. Again, I repeat, volunteer with any of those guys, because <laughs> then you get in the door, you put on your resume, and if they like you, you know, it's a good, good in. I'm keeping Cake and Yuke Night on my calendar. <laughs> so yeah, because it's really why I do this work. 
you know, going back to my own story about wanting to help break those cycles for myself and for those babies being born to my family and then my classroom and then on and on for myself personally and professionally. Yeah, I know it's very important for me to stay connected at the, at the uh, ground floor direct service level for me to be able to kind of keep that uh, fuel in the tank. Otherwise, because it can get on E pretty quick. For me, I'm very lucky because uh, where we work at Home Found, our admin office is um, right next to a big uh, shelter, 80 bed shelter and also 40 units of housing. And we have our culinary academy make uh, lunch every day and anybody can eat there. So I don't normally wear this to work. I normally wear like jeans and a plaid shirt or something. And uh, uh, so you couldn't tell I was an employee versus somebody who's homeless or somebody who's in our culinary training. So I get to sit down every day and have lunch, intentionally try and find a table with somebody I don't know. It's like cafeteria style. And then go and sit down with somebody I don't know and then we just get chatting. So for, it's a great way to um, integrate with people we serve and not lose touch with that and not be in the office. But I don't get to volunteer too much because I also have little kids and that's like another full-time job. <laughs> I have that other full-time job too as a parent, but part of our organizational culture is volunteering. So we are allowed to use work time to volunteer at um, 10,000 degrees, which mm -hmm. helps students, uh, helps young people, first generation typically college students get to and through college. So we, are, uh, we have the opportunity to volunteer uh, during our course of our work day. Uh, I, have, I have a question for, so uh, it sounds like really inspiring work. Can you tell us something about the, the challenges that you're seeing on the horizon? Maybe things that are worrying you about either your organization or the nonprofit world generally? And what, what should we be concerned about? Mm -hmm. Beyond Ben Carson being in charge of HUD? <laughs> <laughs> the federal climate is something of a, of a great worry. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, there is so much uncertainty um, in how that will impact the work on behalf of those who need it the most is uh, difficult to assess. When y I feel as a professional, I'm working to forecast based on tweets. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to know and depend on funding streams that have been perennially important, critical funding streams to support those amongst us that are most vulnerable, knowing that they are highly at risk is challenging. It's going to take new innovation, new creativity, new questions to be asked, bold action, and partnerships across industries that perhaps we've never seen before. Because again, uh, none of us, I firmly believe, can think that we're here alone, or the person next to us is here alone. We literally all need one another. And so uh, I think that is a real challenge at this time overall, uh, because as Paul was saying, uh, Mr. Carson, uh, it's a lot of unknown in regards to what's gonna be coming for the next one, two, three, and four years. I think another crisis that we've seen, um, which is challenging, is over the last 15 plus years, and you all may have experienced this, uh, if you look at this little flat line over 15 years, wages have gone up like this, and housing costs, including rental costs, have gone up like this. So there's this huge disparity that keeps growing between uh, rents and uh, uh, and wages. And so there's continually people getting squeezed out of the market. It's so hard to afford to rent here, let alone buy a home. And so while we may be getting more effective at helping people who are homeless, there's more and more people falling into homelessness. Um, so this, uh, and over the past 10 years, we've underbuilt the amount of housing needed in California. So we're about like a million units short just for California. So we need to keep building housing. However, on the flip side of that, I would say there's some optimism in that the, your generation, the generation coming through is really taking a different lens to creativity for housing. And there's so many innovations coming out. I mean, just last week, somebody in San Francisco 3D printed a house in 24 hours. So if you can 3D print houses, like if that technology in 10 years time, what's that gonna look like? And could we suddenly build houses really, that, 
and I don't know how long that house is going to stand for. If you jump up and down on the second story, is it going to collapse, right? But if we look, if that is one way that we're going, maybe we can solve some of these problems that have been created over the past 10 or 15 years with your generation bringing the innovation forward and finding effective, quick solutions. I mean, one of the complaints that older generations have about the current generation is their short attention span, right? But if the short attention span is, well, let's solve this housing program by creating a house in a week, well, that's a great solution. <laughs> you, know, you guys can do that, hopefully. That's, that'll help. I mean, from a, <clears throat> from a funding perspective, there's always the risk at, uh, of the um, you know, charitable giving tax uh, breaks that you give for don that the government gives for donations going away. So um, if if people are not inspired by getting charitable uh, tax credit from giving money, then there's the incentive to give for some is is at risk. So that's always in the legislation in terms of changes to tax codes. Um, what I'm noticing just really recently is that there is, a, of course, attention uh, to the national needs and some sets that, you know, we're doing okay here in Sonoma County. There's other issues that are bigger and more pressing on a national level, like giving to Planned Parenthood and giving to ACLU, which is really important. I absolutely support those things, but we still have need here locally that is pressing and urgent. California still has the highest child poverty rate in the country. So um, I, I think just to answer your question about current challenges, continuing to keep our eye on you know, the, the local needs while also supporting what needs to happen on a national level. Okay, this one quickly. So just to, just because I want to go back to your question for a moment, <coughs> just kind of triggered something. It's like the three of us, we get to do these positions that we're, we're in well, we're only doing them today because people came before us yes. and did them before us. And we will only be carrying this so long. And then you will have to pick it up to prepare it for the folks who are coming behind you. That's how this works. It's on a continuum. And so literally, we are all in this together. That's just how it works. And so I just wanted to say that out loud that, that we were you I was you, you know, 20 years ago. And you will be me 20 years from now. And so whether it's com computer science, whatever it is that you're looking to do, no matter what you choose, you can always find that one thing to do to make a difference. Because there is no action too small. Every action counts. Can I add on to that, Matt? Yeah. Because it may not be the nonprofit field, yeah. but the only reason I'm here and any of us is because there are people who are making uh, the money and they say, okay, and I want to give it to the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So if you don't see yourself in this field necessarily, but you see yourself you know, in going into banking or, or starting a startup, always know that your giving could then impact right. this. Mm -hmm. So we all have our place here. Yeah. We yeah. really do. Uh, those are actually some wonderful, wonderful notes for us to conclude on. So thank you very much. And, um, yes. Yes.